that I was going to share a message tonight, and then the Lord stopped me, and He put on my heart to share something that segues. I believe it's a bridge from what we shared last week to where we're going next week. And just in case I didn't catch that confirmation of what the Lord wanted me to share tonight, we as a, some brothers meet on Friday mornings at 5 here and 6 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And uh, Brother Morris came in this morning and he said, I just feel this word on my heart, this scripture, and I feel like it needs to be proclaimed to the church. And he had no idea what he was preaching on and the, the scriptures that God had given him and that would burden him with was exactly what I'm preaching on tonight. So that's the witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, the prophetic is found in the prayer house. God wants to reveal himself. He wants to speak to us, but we've got to be positioning ourselves to listen. And that's in the prayer place. You know, what? oftentimes we, we think it's something kind of ambiguous and mystical. No, it's when you begin to tarry with the Lord and you speak to him, he'll speak back to you. And he'll make it very clear what he wants you to know. He's not a God of confusion. He's a God who speaks very clearly. So I'm very confident in what the Lord wanted me to share tonight. Amen. By the witness Amen. of my brother in Christ. You know, I want you to know also that um, I take this time very seriously. The Bible says in James 3.1 that teachers will incur a stricter judgment. I don't know who said it, but my attitude, I always want to be that I would preach and I would share as if it was my last time. And that I would be faithful and obedient that whoever God brings here, that I would be faithful to prepare them for the day they will stand before the Lord. You don't want to come here and have your ears be tickled. We don't have time for that. We are a vapor, a breath. And one day we're going to stand before Almighty God and we're going to give an account of our lives. And we want to stand ready to give that account. Amen. So in, as you look across the landscape, I want to share something that I'm very burdened by. But I want, us to, I want us to be brought into the Word of God that we would hear what God would say in response to this. But we must guard ourselves against humanistic preaching and make sure that we're not falling trapped there. What is humanism? What is humanistic preaching? It is, it is the preaching that the, the chief goal of our time together is to be happy. Whereas biblical preaching is that, the, the whole point is that God is glorified. And humanistic, the mindset, is that God can be seen as a means to an end. I need God to get these things in my life. Whereas biblical understanding of the gospel is, God is the end. And He's worthy of all glory, whatever comes into my life. If you haven't heard a message, I highly recommend it's by a brother named Paris Reedhead called Ten Shekels in a Shirt. It's a message we desperately need, I believe, in the church today. This humanistic message that many times we need to guard ourselves with is not going to really talk about persecution or trials or tribulation. It just wants to kind of look over those parts of the passages of Scripture that deal with suffering. And just to move on to the lighter things. And I, 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 don't, I don't want to be irreverent, but I, 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 to me, I can almost classify it as cotton candy Christianity. You know, it has like an amusing atmosphere. And it smells good. It tastes good. But there's no substance to it. And you keep eating it, you're going to find yourself getting sick. God has called us to have the milk and the meat of His Word. Amen. He wants the full counsel to be revealed for you and I. I think we pray we will come back to the days of George Whitfield. If you, you don't know George Whitfield, he's a contemporary of John Wesley, who at that time, he preached to more people in person than anyone in history. And he said this, he said, It's a poor sermon that gives no offense, that neither makes the hearer displeased with himself nor with the preacher. Now listen, I'm not here to be offensive for offensive sake. That's ridiculous. 
The point is, is the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Amen. And it cuts and it divides between the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and it judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And so you're here tonight to hear the Word of God. Can I get an amen to that? So, I want to talk about something where I believe the enemy has set up. You know, the Bible warns. We talked about this last time. First Timothy, uh, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We talked about how the Spirit says expressly in the last days that there will be those, some who depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. We talked about that. Paul also says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Or as the Greek apostasia, that there will be an apostasy. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. I mean, Jesus warned against this as well, right? In Matthew 24, he talked about those who will be offended and fall away. Those who will leave the faith. I mean, Jesus talked about it even in the, parable of the, uh, the, the parables of the kingdom. He talks about the, the wheat and the tares. He talks about the parable of the sower. That there's four types of soil. And one will receive the word gladly rejoicing but because of trial and tribulation like the sun that comes out the, sh- the soil is shallow and they are going to wither and die and then he talks about also the one that falls among thorns that the cares and the riches and the things of this world will choke out the seed so that it will not produce the, f- the fruit that God's ordained and desires I mean Jesus speaks in Luke 14 I and mean, listen to this when, when do we hear this? We need to hear this. This is unfortunately sometimes what you're not going to hear in a best-selling book or, or getting time on the airwaves. Listen to Jesus. Verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him. Bam! Success. Successful ministry, right? Great multitudes. Wait a minute, it's not finished. And he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Now we know that's a hyperbole. Jesus is saying that your love for me should be so extreme and so extravagant that it looks like hatred towards everyone else in your life. That's how intense our love for Jesus should be. Nothing compares to our first love for Jesus. He goes on to say, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Some of you guys know the story of Pilgrim's Progress. This is pliable. I'll come along with you. Where are we going? And next thing you know, as soon as difficulty comes, what did you get me into? I'm out of here. And and if you know the story of, of Pilgrim's Progress, pliable became an object of mocking in the city of destruction. Saying this man began to build, was not able to finish it. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he, all that he has cannot be my disciple. Sounds very exclusive, doesn't it? So Jesus promises hardship, suffering, rejection, persecution, but 
eternal life through His blood. Everlasting life. But I want to submit to you tonight that the enemy has a specific tactic that I believe is connected to the great apostasy that is already happening in these days. It's found in Job chapter 1. You see, the will of God, as we just read from the words of Jesus, is that we unconditionally surrender to Him. Not conditionally. Not with strings attached. But to declare Jesus is Lord of every part of my life. Amen? Amen. Why, why is this so important? I believe, we're going to see in a moment, because when hardship comes and there is conditional surrender, people begin to blame God. And this is, actually, this is actually a satanic strategy that the scriptures reveal to us because the Lord wants us to know what's going on behind the scenes. Amen. Job chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? I want to interject here and say I'm very bothered because I've heard many messages. And I'm amazed how many preachers that I've heard try to give an explanation as to why Satan had access to Job. And they blamed Job because of sin. And that's why he was attacked. When God himself says he's a blameless man. That's not coming from Job's friend. That's coming from the mouth of God. And if we, and I've heard preachers say this, because we, we want an explanation. Why does Satan have access? Because the scripture said so. And, and we, what can happen is, if you begin to read into the text, which we talked about before, it's called eisegesis. You read into the text what it doesn't say. You miss what God wants you to know. You're too busy making things up and looking into it what you don't want to, what you know, kind of bothers you in your theology that you miss the revelation of Scripture. So what is the revelation of Scripture? God commends Job, and then verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Do you hear that? There's a condition of why he's serving you. But we're going to see, praise God, that Job didn't serve God conditionally. So it says that, have you not made, Satan said, a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and the possessions have decreased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Very specific strategy. We hear the devastation that comes upon Job. And then verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground, and he worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's room, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Backfire, Satan. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. That is unconditional surrender. No strings attached. Then we read in chapter 2, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, and there's none like him on the earth? It's like almost like God's like, repeat, ah, Have you considered? Still blameless. Still upright. One who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now pay attention. 
Because in the we when you do Bible interpretation, you look at certain words and you see if they're repeated again, and there's a connection between the two. So specifically, God says He holds fast to His integrity to Satan. Now listen. So Satan answered the Lord and said, "Skin for skin." Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely, here it is again, curse you to your face. This is his strategy. He's going to blame you for his affliction. That's the devil's strategy. He wants to turn our heart away from the Father so that what the devil does, we blame God for what the enemy has done. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from soul, the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd in which he scraped himself while he was sat in the midst of, of the ashes Now listen to this. This is how we know that the enemy used his wife. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? There's the word integrity. That was planted there by the enemy because he was so riled up by God pointing out that specific attribute of, of Job's life. That was the word that the enemy whispered in his wife's ear. Integrity. He was saying so bothered. That he wants to specifically use the word that, he, that, that was right in his face from Almighty God. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? And then we also know here it is that it's satanic because what does his wife say? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I want to encourage you here tonight, friends. God is on His throne. He's in control. Can I get an amen? He's in control. And we expose the lie of the enemy tonight. That the enemy's tactic is to turn our hearts to distrust the goodness of God. And to blame God for something that's going on in our lives. Now, this is what I want to say tonight in application. What happens when we or someone unconditionally surrenders to the Lord? Number one, you will walk in praise and gratitude. If the Lord does nothing else but shed His blood for you and I that we could be saved, He's done enough. Can I get an amen? Amen. If he does nothing else in our lives, he's worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving forever and ever because he died for us. He's proven his love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He's not like the hireling who runs and flees when no dangers, when the danger comes. He's a good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Praise the Lord, he's proven his love for us. Number two, when we unconditionally surrender to the Lord, we begin to see trials in the light of eternity. And it's an opportunity to get to know the Lord, to know Jesus better. The Bible says, Paul says, everybody wants the power of the resurrection, but Paul says that the fellowship is with his sufferings. And so... When trials come, when unconditional surrender is in our hearts, then we can rejoice because we know that God says to those who persevere, He even has an eternal reward, a crown of life, laid up for those who don't lose heart and keep going and overcoming. And on top of that, we know that God is going to conform us more to the image of Jesus through that trial. And we're going to come to know Jesus better. Praise the Lord. That's God's will for our lives. I I believe, friends, that there is and can be a trial that will bring a crisis of faith for each one of our lives. Just like with Job. And I want our hearts to be prepared that God will be glorified like Job, that we give Him glory 
And we say, Lord, there's no condition of why I love and I serve you. I had that crisis of faith in my life, and I've had it other times where the enemy has tried to come in and say, God's not for you. God's against you. And he's a liar. I remember the time that I was really struck hard with this when my wife was pregnant with our first child, and she had, some of you know the word high premises, but she had it like an extreme level where she was sick every day for nine months, throwing up seven or eight times a day. And I watched her believing in healing, believing that God can do the miraculous, and watching her day after day with nothing in her stomach, not to get too graphic, but to throw up nothing but bile. Watching her body racked and shaking over the toilet because there was nothing there, and that's all it was. And she, her hair was falling out, her teeth were being impacted, her enamel because of all of that coming out of her stomach. Oh yes, friend, I struggled to see that. I think sometimes it's easier if it was against me, right, or against you, than one of your loved ones. Watching it day after day after day, and I was, I was, I was tired. That's another thing you have to be careful of, right, when you're fatigued. I was, I, was wor- I was working to provide. I was going as a full-time student to, at Moody in Chicago, and Moody prides himself in cramming 30 years into four. So many nights at four o'clock, I mean two o'clock in the morning, getting back up in the morning and doing starting all over and watching as she's just sick and just bedridden. And I, I remember by the grace of God that she was able to, to, we were able to have Abigail. Then two years later, it starts all over again. That second time, I broke. I was even more exhausted, and this time it was so bad that I remember taking her to the hospital, and the doctor said, because she was like holding her skin, and you know, and pinch it, and it would stay up. The doctor said, as the examiner, if you had come a day later, your child would have died. There's no more, there's like almost no more amniotic fluid left. And I remember going, what is going on? I believe God. I believe you're a healer. Why? Here comes the enemy. Just curse him. Right? That's, that's what, I mean, just blame God. It's, he, it's his fault. That, that's where it comes down. And here I am. And I come before the Lord. And this is where Job, this is where Job fell short. Job at the end justified himself more than he justified God. And I came before the Lord, and I, I had some words to say. I poured out my complaint to the Lord. And I said, I'm done, God. And I began to complain. And the Lord said to me, who is this that darkens my counsel? I'm in straight from Scripture. And began to, to put me in my place. And I just shut up. And I said, but I, I'm in my heart, I was... I was just kind of like, see, God is a good God. He wants to speak. So as I cried out to the Lord for revelation, it was, it was a place, though, I, I was almost got like, I almost, I almost was like, just at a place of almost indifference. But the Lord, He heard my cry. He heard my plea. And two weeks later, you know how He often does? He speaks when you least expect it sometimes. You know what I mean? Like you're not even, all of a sudden you're doing some kind of day-to-day thing, and boom, download. And I was, that was what, I was right at coming out of class, and he spoke to me so clearly. He said, son, I'm not outside the fire, I'm in the fire with you. And immediately, he brought to my mind the three Hebrew boys, and he said, there was three thrown in, but there was a fork that was seen in the fire. One like the Son of God. 
And then he told me to go back and look at the passage. And when I went back, and I know this might sound elementary to you, but to me it was a revelation. I went back and I looked at the book of Daniel. And as I saw what the scriptures reveal, it says that they were thrown in with cords on them. But they walked out free. And the Lord said to me, Son, I'm freeing you of things that are binding in your life. Of self-dependence and pride and other things that are obstructing what I want to do through your life. It was Smith Wigglesworth who I said, it was mightily used of God, who said, I found that if a man wants to be used by God, he's going to be broken a thousand times. Because the flesh is so weak, we actually think it's us. And apart from him, we can do nothing. But you can say that with your mouth, but when you go through trials, you begin to learn it, that becomes a reality in your spirit. And that's what God did. He showed me that he was actually using the fire for his glory to free me. That I would walk as I have been called to walk. And such is the same for you also. Just Just a few more. Number three. When we unconditionally surrender to the Lord... We grow spiritually. We grow spiritually. We we counter the culture of self-entitlement. This entitlement that pervades the land is very immature. And we will not become uh, like a two-year-old throwing a tantrum because we didn't get our way. But we say, God, I will follow you no matter what. You know, the Philippians says that we're not to complain, we're not to murmur, so that we will be like stars, hallelujah, shining brightly for the Lord. And when we are fully surrendered and walking in that thanksgiving, we're growing in maturity, even as it says in Romans 5, that, per, that, that trial produces perseverance, and the perseverance character, that we're growing in our character, that God will be glorified as we shine His light through our lives. Yes. You know, the, the spirit of entitlement. Jesus spoke very clearly, I, I was thinking about Luke 17. We talked about which one of you having a servant, plowing, attending sheep, uh, will say to him, once he comes to the field, come at once and sit down and eat. But he will not say to him, prepare something, rather something, prepare for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? Jesus says, I don't think so. So you likewise, when you've done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. That's an unconditional heart. <laughs> I serve you whether I get rewarded or not. Because you're worthy. Just a couple more. Number four. When we are unconditionally surrendered, friend, we walk in true spiritual authority. We often quote James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee. But the Bible says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee. It's the story of the centurion. The centurion said, you don't even have to come to my house. You just say the word and they're going to be healed. Because I'm a man under authority. And I say go and he goes. I say come and he comes. I say do this, he does that. Why did that centurion know his authority? Because he was under authority. And when we are under authority, when we're fully submitted to God, friend, we walk in fearless authority against the devil. We can say with Jesus, the enemy is coming, but he can find nothing in me. There's confidence, not in ourselves, but in the Lord. Praise God for spiritual authority. I praise God for that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be before you right now. I would have made shipwreck of my faith a long time ago, and I would have been picked off by the evil one. But by the grace of God, because He's shown me, as long as I'm submitted to Him, as long as I'm under His authority, I'm following Him, then I have authority to resist the enemy. 
Lastly, when we are unconditionally surrendered to God, we walk in true freedom. There are three emotions that will manifest, speaking from experience as you would also, that manifest when we have something that's not submitted to God. That doesn't mean that you and I are not to be honest in prayer. You look at the Psalms, total freedom to pray, to pour out our hearts and our complaint, and to be honest with God. We are not to pretend like there's something not wrong. However, God's will is that we do not stay in a place of fear or anxiety or anger. And those three emotions reveal that that thing is not surrendered to God. There is still a control over our lives when we have anger in our hearts. We are trying to control something or someone. We can't. When we surrender, we place it in God's hands, and then His peace can come. So anger or anxiety or fear. I highly recommend a mess, series of messages that deeply impacted me in every one that I've given them to. It's simply and kind of funnily, f- funny in that it's called The Pineapple Story. And I highly recommend it to you. It's by, told by a missionary named Otto Koning. And it's worth your time. It's worth your time. And he's funny. He's a funny storyteller. But what Otto says, and I say this in wrapping this number five up. He submits there are some areas that we need to submit to God to watch to see if there's anger or anxiety or fear there. Such as our health. God's not called us to be hypochondriacs. And He's not called us to be in a position to wonder if something's coming upon us, that that fear rises up. When that reveals itself, it's saying, I've not submitted my health to God. When we submit our health to God, we are confident that He is the Lord of our bodies. We don't fear sickness. The Lord is in control. We also need to submit our finances and our possessions to God. If there's anxiety in our hearts, if there's fear in our hearts concerning concerning finances and possessions, it's revealing we are still trying to control that thing. When you place it in God's hands, you can walk in peace. And when something doesn't go right, when it goes bad, it's in the Lord's hands. So you have confidence that God's going to do something for His glory to work it through that situation. Case in point, my daughter had her catalytic converter stolen last week. Not cool. But you know what? The Lord... Is the Lord of that car we already dedicated to God? So what does God want from that? Well, I guarantee you one thing. That thief didn't know he's going to get prayed for in Jesus' name. (laughs) And so God is more concerned about that soul than our catalytic converter. Maybe our prayers are the only prayers that are going to touch that thief that he would repent and know Jesus Christ. Because God makes all things work together for good. To those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. We need to submit our relationships to God. We, we, when we find ourselves getting angry or worked up, that is saying that I'm trying to control. No, I can't. I've got to submit that relationship to God. That's God's, that he, that's, that's God's responsibility. I'm not going to be a people pleaser. I'm not going to be so caught up in people's opinions of me that I have to do everything in order to please them. That's not God's will for you or I. We lay them in God's hand. We lay that relationship in God's hands. And if the Lord is the Lord of that relationship, then I'm at peace. Amen. Because I can't change your heart and you can't change mine. Newsflash. Only the Lord can change the heart. So when we submit it to Him, we allow Him to do what He can do. 
and we find our identity in Him. We also need to submit our reputations to God. And if we feel people are slandering us, or talking behind our back, or gossiping, or misrepresenting to us, and you get, mm, you all get flustered up, what is that revealing? You're still in control of your own reputation. But when you submit it to God, God becomes your defender. Boy, I learned that the hard way on our, my, my, our family's last missionary assignment. I got slandered left and right, friend, on a daily basis. And I can tell you my flesh rose up in the beginning. Man, I was just loving on this person. I was trying to be a good friend to them. And they're going around talking behind my back and spreading all kinds of lies about me. And then coming back in my face and saying, how you doing, Wade? Like as if nothing happened. And if I am in control of my own reputation, friend, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a bull in the china shop. But if Jesus is the Lord of my reputation, then I can bless those who curse me, and I can pray for those who despitefully use me and persecute me, and I can let God be the one who's in control. Because you know what? When that happens to you, you're in good company because that happened to Jesus Christ. We need to submit our time to the Lord rather than getting frustrated with the traffic or anything else in your life. If you've submitted it to God, then you can be at peace that you're in step with the Father and that He wants to use that time that seems inconvenient for His own glory. And I'll tell you, if you don't know this already, there are times that you think it's very inconvenient and crazy and if you, are, if you submit it to God, you will find that those are some of the most amazing times of seeing the Father's glory. And He will open up some crazy door for you that you're like, whoa! I would have missed it if I was so focused on my own agenda and my own schedule. I would have missed the God moment. I would have missed a moment of destiny. Praise the Lord when we submit our time to God. And lastly, we need to submit our futures to God. We need to release the control to Him, not to be anxious for tomorrow, because we don't even know what tomorrow will bring, Jesus says. And it doesn't amount to anything. We can't add one, one inch to our stature. We can't make one hair black or white. It's absolutely pointless. I think, I forgot who said it. Who said, worrying is like sitting on a rocking chair. A lot of work, but you're not going anywhere. <laughs> so don't do it. It's a waste of time and energy. But we submit it to God and we say, Lord, you are the Lord of my future. So we're going to close in prayer right now. I want you to just, I want you to pray with me. But I felt led tonight as our brother Ricky just leads quietly in the background. There is something significant about repentance. And tonight you may feel convicted about something. And the worst thing you can do is to try to, try to suppress that and not repent. Because God wants you to be filled with His fruit and His life. And so, just humble yourself like I've had to do many times. And ask God for forgiveness for areas that you have been trying to control. <clears throat> or if there's a conviction of, have I, and I want to declare tonight that I unconditionally surrender to Jesus. That God in His great mercy would be able to look at me and say, Have you considered my son or my daughter? And that we will be found in that place to give glory to God. That all the angels and all heaven would be looking at this individual and saying, Look at the way they trust in the Lord. Unconditional surrender. Just like Abraham. Given the promised seed of Isaac and willing to lay him on the altar 
His whole future, his whole inheritance, his whole destiny, laying it down and saying, I'm willing, God, because I love you more than anything in, my, in myself or anything that you've given to me. That we would hear the angels say as well, now I know that you fear God. So Lord, tonight, have your way in this place. Let us respond as we ought to respond in the name of Jesus.